The channel has grown a lot recently, which is awesome. Thanks to everyone that has subscribed and to everyone commenting on the videos. It may be obvious to say, but the growth of the channel and all of the engagement in the comments makes the project feel very worthwhile for me. The S&P 500 is an index of 500 US stocks that covers roughly 80% of the available US market capitalization. It is one of the oldest and best known stock indexes in the world. The S&P Dow Jones Indices website says that there are 3.4 trillion US dollars indexed to the S&P 500. That is 3.4 trillion US dollars invested in index funds that are tracking the S&P 500 index. That is a lot of money invested in the S&P 500. Investing in the S&P 500 has worked out really, really well. From 1980 through May 2019, the S&P 500 index has, on average, beaten the crisp 110 US total market index, while also being less volatile. I'm Ben Felix, Portfolio Manager at PWL Capital. In this episode of Common Sense Investing, I'm going to tell you whether or not investing in the S&P 500 is a good idea. The S&P 500 is synonymous with index investing. There have to be a ton of people out there who refer to themselves as index investors while only investing in the S&P 500. One of the most compelling arguments for investing in the S&P 500 is its past performance. The risk-adjusted performance, especially since the end of the financial crisis, has been staggering. And by staggering, I mean almost impossibly good. Jared Kaiser, the chief investment officer for Buckingham Strategic Wealth, wrote a blog post in late 2018 where he examined the performance of the S&P 500 from March 2009 through October 2018. He used a method called bootstrapping to show that, statistically, the actual performance of the S&P 500 over that time period was almost too good to have been statistically possible. The bootstrap simulation involved taking all of the historical monthly returns for the S&P 500 from 1926 through October 2018, and then drawing out 116 monthly returns to create a return series that is the same length as the period from March 2009 through October 2018. This can be done countless times to simulate possible outcomes using the actual historical data as a sample set. In Kaiser's analysis, he ran 100,000 simulated 116-month periods, which he was then able to compare to the actual performance of the S&P 500 index. His findings were unbelievable. He found that of the 100,000 bootstrap samples, only 0.57% of them had better risk-adjusted returns than what the S&P 500 actually achieved from March 2009 through October 2018. The actual results of the index were almost outside the range of statistical possibility. The main takeaway from this analysis, and the point that I want to make here, is that while the S&P 500 has recently produced fantastic performance, the probability of that performance repeating itself in the future is extremely low. As always, past performance does not predict future performance, but in this case, we have statistical evidence to show that the likelihood of the recent past performance repeating itself is extremely low. Further to this point, the S&P 500 is a lot more actively managed than most people realize. It is not simply the 500 largest stocks in the US. It is a committee-based index. The stocks that go into the index are selected by a committee of people, not by some algorithm. There are selection criteria but the ultimate decision on inclusion and exclusion for the index is made by a group of humans. The ultimate goal of this committee of humans is to build an index that represents large cap US equity markets, but there's still a human element, which makes repeating the exceptional past results of the index even more unlikely. I mentioned at the beginning of this video that the S&P 500 covers roughly 80% of the US stock market capitalization. That's pretty good coverage by market capitalization but there are closer to 3,500 stocks that exist in the US market. Owning 500 of the 3,500 stocks available leaves substantial room for error in accessing the returns of the US stock market. Even further to that point, there are many more thousands of stocks that exist globally. Owning 500 of them leads to an increased chance of missing out on the global equity premium. Hendrik Bessenbinder at Arizona State University just came out with a new paper titled Do Global Stocks Outperform US Treasury Bills? He and his co-authors found that from 1990 to 2018, 1.3%, or 811, of the 62,000 global common stocks that were studied explained all of the wealth creation in excess of what could have been earned in treasury bills. 1.3%. Finding those stocks is like finding a needle in a haystack. But we know that diversification is the answer to capturing equity premiums. We know that a small number of stocks have driven most of the wealth creation in the US and global markets over time. 
We also know that smaller stocks, including many of the roughly 3,000 stocks that are not in the S&P 500, tend to beat larger stocks over the long term. Again, while the S&P 500 has been able to beat the US market as a whole and the global market, the likelihood of that performance persisting is low and giving up diversification can come with a hefty price. Past performance aside, one of the most common arguments that I hear in favor of investing in the S&P 500 is that its constituents get roughly half of their revenues from outside of the US. Who needs global diversification when you have the S&P 500? You. You need global diversification. The fact that the S&P 500 constituents have global revenue sources does not offer you, the investor, the benefits of global diversification. A 2019 paper from Vanguard titled Global Equity Investing, The Benefits of Diversifying and Sizing Your Allocation addressed this exact question. The authors showed that while US stocks had the lowest volatility of any country from 1970 through September 2018, the global market cap weighted portfolio, including the US and all other countries, had even lower volatility. To prove this point, we can simply turn back the clock and look at the past returns of US, Canadian, and international stocks. We know that the past decade has favored US stocks in general, and the S&P 500 in particular, but if we go back to the period starting in January 1970, ending June 2009, Canadian, US, and international stocks all had very similar returns. Over that period, the S&P 500 returned 9.66%, while the MSCI EFI returned 9.28%, and the S&P TSX returned 9.42%, all in Canadian dollars. The US still had a small edge, but a rebalanced portfolio split equally across Canadian, US, and international stocks returned 9.84%, with lower volatility than any of the individual countries. This is, of course, the free lunch of diversification at work. The Vanguard paper goes on to explain that while the correlation of global stocks has increased over time, which is often used as an argument against global diversification, correlation does not tell the whole story. Even as correlations have increased, the dispersion of US and non-US stock returns has remained wide. In other words, even though markets may tend to move more in the same direction, the magnitude of those movements has continued to be very different from country to country, meaning that there is still a substantial benefit to owning global stocks. A 2011 paper from AQR titled International Diversification Works, eventually, looked at 22 developed markets from 1950 through 2008 and examined the effects of diversification over short and long-term periods. Of course, anyone investing in stocks should be most concerned about the long-term. The authors found that while short-term market downturns can be driven by investors changing risk preferences, or panics as some may describe it, longer-term results are driven more by the economic performance of countries. The paper concludes as follows. Diversification protects investors against the adverse effects of holding concentrated positions in countries with poor long-term economic performance. Let us not fail to appreciate the benefits of this protection. To the point of the AQR paper, we have to keep in mind that the world can change. The US stock market currently makes up roughly 55% of the global market capitalization, but that has not always been the case. In 1989, Japan made up 45% of the global stock market, while the US was sitting at only 29%. From January 1989 through June 2019, Japanese stocks have returned 0.61% per year on average in Canadian dollar terms, and Japan now makes up roughly 8% of the global market. Betting on one country, no matter how dominant its market is at the moment, increases the likelihood of a bad outcome. Lastly, no discussion about investing in the S&P 500, or US stocks in general, is complete without mentioning valuations. You all know that I am not a market timer, but it is well documented that current valuations are the best predictor of future returns. When prices are high, future returns tend to be lower. The S&P 500 has a price earnings ratio of 20.5 as of June 30th, 2019, while Canadian stocks are trading at 14.6 and international developed stocks are trading at 14.7. I'm not saying that you should bet against US stocks. We know that valuations can continue to rise for a long time. But betting only on the most expensive market does not seem sensible either. I have explained that the S&P 500 is probably not the most reliable approach to capturing US stock returns, despite its past performance, and that the S&P 500 does not offer exposure to global stock returns, even though its constituents have global revenue sources. If you are currently using the S&P 500 for your US equity allocation, it's not the end of the world. Compared to an actively managed fund or a stock picking strategy, the S&P 500 is extremely well diversified, and it can be accessed for almost no cost due to the massive scale of the ETFs tracking it. However, 
The S&P 500 is not the only index that you should own in your portfolio, and it probably isn't even the best index to own for your US stock exposure. As usual, the best bet that most investors can make is a bet on the total stock market through a globally diversified portfolio of total stock market index funds. Do you invest in the S&P 500? Tell me about it in the comments. Thanks for watching. My name is Ben Felix of PWL Capital and this is Common Sense Investing. If you enjoyed this video, please share it with someone who you think could benefit from the information. And don't forget, if you've run out of Common Sense Investing videos to watch, you can tune into weekly episodes of the Rational Reminder podcast wherever you get your podcasts.